So we will start in like one minute. So uh, welcome to this webinar on progress of AI in healthcare. What are AI companies doing now? So this webinar is presented by Corbett AI, InVivo AI, and Imagia. Uh, I'm Sarah Jean, Digital Marketing and Event Associate at Corbett AI. I will be the moderator today. So we have reunited professional experts in AI and data science to inform you about AI progress and research in the medical sector to improve patient outcomes. So in this webinar, we will have two talks and a short presentation of a training program uh, powered by AI, followed by the question period at the end. In the meantime, should you have any questions for a guest speaker, I invite you to write them in the chat section. We will ask them at the end. Also, for those who could not join us today, a recording of this webinar will be uh, made available for you on our YouTube channel. So to kickstart this presentation, I would like to introduce Corbett AI briefly. So we created these uh, webinar series on progress in AI. So as of this moment, health, some healthcare companies are using AI solutions to augment their patient outcomes, to make great savings and augment their efficiency. With AI technologies, companies have more time to focus on higher level projects in healthcare without spending time resolving problems. Data science brings great tools, but very often professionals aren't adequately trained in data science. This is when Corbett AI arrives to help. So we have AI powered learning platform with a unique personalized curriculum and an AI tutor designed to subvert the one size fits all teaching approach used widely. Uh, we're helping companies to fill their team's knowledge gap and to accelerate the work efficiency. So why is data science training essential? So data science empowers companies to make most of the valuable data they are collecting. Also, it's very important to be adequately trained in data science for two reasons. Uh, first, this emerging field is rapidly evolving and uh, keeping it to date is critical in order to follow the evolution of the sector. Secondly, uh, data science is building upon its existing foundation. Having a resource to turn to when you need to review this foundation is also critical for any data scientist. So what is Corbett? Uh, so Corbett can serve as an excellent learning platform for professionals and teams. Corbett teaches data science, machine learning, and prerequisites using a combination of video lectures, interactive dialogue, problem solving exercises that can help you acquire new knowledge and skills or to refresh all ones. So a recent pilot analysis done in partnership with FPT software uh, showed that over 150 users, uh, uh, the Corbett like the, the, the Corbett platform result in an average of 22.6% increase in uh, overall learning gain, which is uh, pretty great. So I wanted to just show you briefly our features on our platform. Uh, first is our intelligent tutor, Corby. Uh, is actually what sets us apart from other similar platforms. Corbett acts as a teacher and a guide on our platform. She leads users through their personalized skills and adapt to a user's learning style and understanding levels in a real time. Corbett engages in conversations, offers life personalized feedback, and gives problem solving exercise. And she's providing textual hints. She's suggesting an equation. She's showing a concept tree and she provides a multiple choices answer. So another uh, feature is the flexible curriculum. So uh, another advantage to using Corbett is the flexible cur curriculum that provides 
uh, per personalized, like which can be personalized to your needs. We provide flexibility within this provided curriculum. Essentially, this feature means that the student is free to move around in this curriculum as they choose, eliminating, eliminating the strict linear path that exists with other courses. Students can jump forward or backward as needed to review all material or skip material they already know. This flexible curriculum can uh, let Corbett offer an impressive 500 uh, unique learning path. As our platform grows, we increase the amount of content we have. This number will only grow. And our last feature is the programming tutor. So that's a new thing we have, and it's very, very cool. Uh, in order to teach real world data a science application, we have also implemented Corby as a programming tutor. She provides coding exercises in Python, which is one of the most popular programming languages for data science. Through testing of submitted solution, Corby is also uh, able to isolate errors in your code and provide feedback to help you create a working program. Being able to code efficiently is a critical skill for any data scientist, and Kobe can help you learn to do that. If so, to conclude briefly, uh, you all know that continued data science training is essential for companies in any sector, including healthcare. This is why we're currently working with companies to help redefine their AI training program and implement one if there isn't one. This company joined actually our new free limited program where their employees and our teams can train in data science. So if you have any questions about it, we'd invite you to send us a message. I will give you the email. And if you have any questions about Corbett, I invite you to write them in the chat section. Uh, we will answer them at the end. So thanks again for listening for this short presentation. Now let's move to the first guest speaker, Tess Berti from Imagia. So I will quit this. And you can go test. Can you all see my screen? Okay, good. Uh, thanks, Sarah Jeanne. Uh, that's very nice. Uh, good presentation. I didn't know about all of this. I think you can see everything now. Okay. So what I want to talk uh, about today is like uh, most of the research we do at Imagia. Uh, I'm sorry, Sebastian, there is nothing really new that you will learn here. It's mostly uh, what we've published uh, in the last years. Um, so just a little word about Imagia. Uh, it's been founded in 2015 uh, and it's already like 60 plus uh, employee even through uh, during the COVID we're still recruiting a lot. Uh, it's a lot of engineers, developers, but also research scientists and uh, machine learning developers or researchers, etc. It's in Montreal. Uh, it's right in the same building as uh, Facebook and Eventai and there's a Mila. And we do a lot of collaborations with uh, hospitals, but also industries and academia, like for example, we have a lot of interns coming from uh, Zemila and other um, university, Dalazi, France sometimes uh, to do internships, but also to just collaborate on the research level. So um, it's already pretty big, but what we do here and what I do also is like, um, we try to accelerate uh, the access to personalized uh, healthcare and uh, diagnosis. So it's very general. We regroup data from multiple sources that could be uh, an hospital uh, or an academic institution that have a lot of data. And we try to find the correct AI solution uh, corresponding and then propose uh, a solution that could be either discovering a new digital biomarker or uh, just segmentation, uh, other very uh, applied uh, machine learning tasks. Um, it's more than that, as the whole process is very long and goes through different teams at Imagia. So um, some of the teams are research only, some other are developers, some are working on the evidence platform, which uh, contains all of this, uh, which means ingesting the data, indexing it, uh, cohorting the data, then doing the annotation if it's not already done, or sometimes redoing the annotation, because uh, you might know that 
when you work with hospitals, not all the hospitals annotate the data the same way. So this is a lot of pre-processed work to do. Uh, all the nitty, nitty, nice deep learning research is uh, in fact a very, very low percentage of what happens really in this whole scheme. Uh, then when you have the data and everything is clean and everything is organized, uh, you can go through exploring it, seeing, okay, what kind of data it is, is it, uh, what's the side and what can we do uh, as a study for our models design and to propose uh, an AI ready solution, train it, and then either discover new biomarkers, either uh, work on segmentation or classification on all the uh, very basic, basic tasks that you can have. Um, also, what we have is federated learning. This is something I will talk to you after, uh, but which permits to, to use data from different hospital centers without uh, having uh, direct access to the data and staying anonymized through the whole process and then leveraging the information you get from each hospital to train a model. So um, as for me, I'm a research scientist working in the open innovation team. So I will mostly talk about the research that we do there. Um, it's a very specific project. I'm not talking about everything, but uh, I will talk to you about federated learning, self-evolving AI, and also uh, more what is my domain, which is explainability and interpretability uh, in AI. Uh, our team, we are like six full-time employees for now with me. And we usually have uh, 10 to 15 interns during the summer. So it's a very big uh, research nest uh, with a lot of people around and a lot of management of interns, but uh, we're still seeking for new hiring uh, as machine learning developers in this team, for example. So it's, it's always growing and always uh, adding something to, to the ecosystem in our uh, industry. So uh, let's start with uh, a research project I did uh, a while ago. Uh, Sebastian, I know this one pretty well, you heard about it a lot, but um, as you might know, annotating data takes a lot of time and we don't want uh, ex like medical experts to, to have to annotate everything. And if we could, for example, ease their work by having a model that annotates intuitively uh, or learns how to annotate images, uh, that would be great. Uh, most of the project uh, will tend to already have um, models that worked on images that have segmentation masks. So like experts have already annotated the images and the model will learn to annotate the images like them. So it could be segmentation like here, for example, this is a, an image of a fundus, a knife fundus. And what you see is a mask around the artifact and the fundus. So, you could totally get uh, your data and the segmentation mask with it and learn how to do it. But what we thought is these annotations are very hard to get by because it requires a lot of uh, time from the experts. And also when you have different experts working on the data, they don't always annotate the same way. Some of them can be more lazy uh, or some of them can be more precise. So it, gives a lot of bias in the way of annotating data. So what we do here is that we only take data that is not annotated uh, with any markings, but we just know that this is healthy and this is unhealthy data. So for example, this is in one uh, healthy data and two and three unhealthy data that you can see. So we just get a model that is able to classify this is healthy, this is not healthy and it does the classification. And at the end, we look inside the model and say, okay, where do you think, uh, what pixels, what part of the image makes you think it's healthy or unhealthy? And with this, you can find uh, that here, like what's not, are um, artifacts inside the image, uh, like uh, micro aneurysms, uh, exit dates, and other parts that uh, say that the patient has a retinopathy. So this is a very specific um, example, but it can also be done for any type of medical data, like 
lung nodules, it worked pretty well, and um, uh, other types. So I will show the example at the end. Um, one other project, a uh, big uh, branch that we're working on is uh, self-evolving models. So um, as you might know, most of the deep learning models today are made to work on natural images like data set like ImageNet, uh, Coco, et cetera. So those are mostly images of, you know, cats, dogs, trucks, uh, which are very general and very big. So makes like a pretty good model to train on. Uh, but for medical images, most of the time it's uh, black and white images, not the same size, not the same textures. So it does make it sense to, to use the same models, but not always. So what we do here is that we have a model that build itself upon the data. So it's data specific. So if you have a very specific type of data, which happens a lot uh, in, medical, uh, in medical data and medical imaging, uh, then the model will just learn to create its own structure and to uh, fine tune itself over the data set. Uh, what is nice with, with this, that uh, anyone can use it without being an expert in AI and uh, can just run this model so it builds itself upon the data and gets a very good accuracy. And also most of the times uh, it's, it's lighter and uh, shorter to train. Um, so another branch, a uh, very big one is federated learning. So what is federated learning? I talked a little about it in the beginning. It's uh, getting data from different uh, sources, which could be hospitals, for example, and trying to leverage the information of all of this data. So for example, I don't know if you can see my pointer okay, here. For example, here uh, you have different distribution of data. Uh, those are nodule size. So let's say, for example, you have an hospital that have CT scans of uh, patients with lung nodules, and the nodules are very, very tiny. Another one, you have bigger nodules, uh, another one even bigger, and in the last one is like kind of more balanced. So what happens here is that if you train a model only on the first hospital, then the model is only able to recognize tiny nodules. If you train another model on this uh, second hospital, then it's able to, to learn on uh, bigger nodules. But if you try to get this model to work on this data or this versa, then it would not work as well uh, as if it was trained on all the data at the same time. But most of the time, you can't compile all of the data together because, um, well, the, the data is anonymized from one hospital to another. It's very hard to, to get, you, you can't get it inside the industry. It stays at the hospital itself. So what we do is that we make a model. Uh, most of the time it's, uh, it's one of the self-evolving model that will learn to uh, work on like both these four distributions and use every parts of the data, but from the cloud. So just getting the data from the hospital and running over it, and then uh, get a better score than the individual scores that you could get for each of the model on each data. So this in red is what you get as an accuracy for our model and uh, the more shallow um, stats here are what you would get for each of the model uh, data sets individually. Uh, what you can see here is a heat map of where the model is looking at when it's, uh, it's classifying to say is, if there is a nodule or not in the, uh, the images. So this is a ground trough uh, with a little red square and this is what we get. So it's pretty good. It's just one example, but uh, in general, it works pretty well on this size of data. Mm -hmm. uh, something that is nice to point out here is that um, CT scan data is 3D data and 3D data sets are very hard to train on because it's uh, computationally taxing. So here we have a very good proof of concept that we can do it on 3D uh, CT scans. 
uh, it's patches, so it's not the full uh, lung uh, volume, but it's already there. And we can also do it with federated learning and with the self-evolving AI that we have. Um, now, this is this, uh, just a little slide about what I talked on uh, explainability uh, with the uh, retina funders that we've seen uh, first. So um, it's how you look inside the model and see which, where, are, where the model is looking at, what are the important pixels to make uh, a decision. Um, this is very important. This is a very big uh, part of my own research and interpretability and explainability because uh, as a clinician, you have that like you have a model that is working in that asset, but you don't know how because it, it's such a black box. And it's very hard to trust to say, okay, so this model is working, so I can I can make it work on any other data set, which most of the time doesn't work. Uh, so explainability and interpretability is nice here because uh, there are a lot of surprises. For example, uh, I run a model over a data set of healthy and unhealthy patients and got 99% of accuracy and was like, oh, this is a very good model, but as a research scientist, you, you're pretty doubtful of this kind of result because it's too good to be true. Uh, so you look at the heat maps and to see where uh, the model has been looking at to do the classification of your images. And in fact, in this specific example, and it happened a lot after also, it's that uh, the image of the healthy patients came from one hospital and the image from the unhealthy patients came from another hospital. Both had the same machine to take the images, but uh, apparently uh, in one hospital, the bed was different whereas the patients were lying. So there were two rails uh, under the bed. And in fact, all classifier wasn't classifying lung nodules, it was classifying the rail under the bed of the patient. So it's little things like that, that sometimes you don't see as a human. Uh, it could also be, for example, if you have data coming from uh, different centers, it could also be uh, as um, uh, the compression of the data. Your, for example, your uh, model could be able to classify over this. So sometimes you're thinking that your model is working and because you, you can see how it really works, uh, it's hard to like to be totally trustful. So we applied all of those little, uh, this heat map is one of these little um, uh, checkup to, to make sure that the model is really working where we want. And here really it's classifying on the artifacts. So we're, we're like, okay. This is good. And I'm gonna go because I don't have a lot of time left, but uh, very briefly on this. Uh, we also do work on domain adaptation, which is if you have a set of data that has label on another set that doesn't have any labels, for example, you can use uh, a model that being trained on one of them and then um, another that is trained on the other one to improve the accuracy of both. So it's like using information from one data to another. Um, this is a research that has been conducted in our group by another research scientist. And another cool example that I really like, uh, those are CT scans, uh, but not real CT scans. Those, those have been generated uh, by a GAN, a uh, generative algorithm in our group. So um, what the purpose of this is that, for example, if you don't have uh, a lot of data, which happens a lot in medical imaging, where you, you will have just 50 to 200 pa patients, which sometimes is really, really, really low to train a model, then you can do all data augmentation. So you, you train a model to learn how to replicate this data, but not exactly the same, but with the general thinking of uh, this is a learning CT scans and you can add nodules inside it, etc. So uh, this is an ongoing project and GANs, generative models have been existing for a while, but uh, GANs in 3D are very hard to, to come by because in between each slice, you have to have a continuity of the generation 
So it's not generating one image, then generating another one, then generating another one. It's like generating images that goes together in the Z, X, and Y plan. So yeah. And that's it. That's very great. I think there's a question that could be answered now because it was uh, related to one of the images you showed in your presentation test. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so let's insert live. For the example you mentioned, is this happening because the data are not coming from the same distribution? Uh, is it was a federated learning? Was it? Yeah. Oh, see, it's uh, from Guy Herman. Uh, Let me. Could... Uh... No, not here. Uh, where exactly? Which slide? I can see the questions. Oh. What's the question exactly? Can you repeat? Please. Yes. Yeah. I, I can stop uh, the sharing and maybe. Uh, okay, I can see the question now. No, no, no. Okay, I think you're. I don't know exactly what you've been, uh, where where you want to see it, Guy. Uh, is it the distribution? Do you remember for what example? Oh, you mentioned training. Oh, yeah. The... yeah. Okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I see. Um, no, well, the data are, are like, we're coming not from the same distribution. Well, it's true that, like, one data set was coming from one hospital and the other from another one. So yeah, it was in the same distribution, but the problem was really because um, the bed where the patient's life was different. And in both data set, you could, it, you could see it. Well, as human, we didn't see it because we were only focusing on the nozzle inside the lungs and we didn't take care, took care of really looking at what were the materials around. But this could also happen, for example, I had it a lot with um, x-rays where uh, patients that are uh, unhealthy have a lot of intravenous um, uh, needles. So the model focuses on the intravenous needles instead of focusing on a pneumonia or, uh, um, or the illness that the patient has. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to see that your model sometimes is really looking at something you would not look at uh, during your classification, then you're totally biased by it. Uh, there are other than I think. OK, uh, so I used to use a lot ResNet uh, and Inception at the beginning. Uh, now I'm using a lot of SqueezeNet, in fact, because it's very lightweight and I'm not looking for uh, accuracy in research. I'm mostly looking, OK, is this working? And it's really easy to interpret. Uh, but now what the team is mostly using are uh, the self-evolving uh, AI, which names is Inas. Uh, but if, if I had a data set to just classify, I think I will go for a ResNet or a SqueezeNet uh, right away uh, to, to do my proof of concept. SqueezeNet? No, SqueezeNet. Uh, I can write it in the chat. You want to? Okay, super. Uh, is there any, well, we will ask the other question at the end of the, the webinar. So I saw one that someone wrote, we'll ask them at the end after uh, Sebastian's uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that okay? We, you wrote the squeeze net in the chat, perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll answer to them after then, or, or I'll chat with him during uh, Sebastian's talk. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so you can start uh, to share your screen, Sebastian. Thank you. There we go. Can you see that? Yeah. OK, so I'll kick things off. Well, thanks for inviting uh, myself and to present our company and some of the work we do. It's, uh, it's really great to be, to be here with some former colleagues, uh, common faces. Um, OK, so a couple, couple words on, on the company. 
Um, so we funded the company two and a half years ago with the, uh, the goal of uh, expanding some of the research we have done as a graduate and postgraduate research, uh, uh, researcher. Uh, so the, the main topics of the company is about uh, how can we better predict uh, molecular properties uh, of molecule to develop novel drugs. Uh, so we're working uh, in this drug discovery um, process, I would say earlier than uh, where Imagia lands. Uh, so we are at the preclinical uh, phase of drug discovery where we are trying to find uh, the most suitable uh, small molecule to treat a specific disease. Uh, so yes, we're interested in, in uh, predicting small molecule properties. We're interested in uh, generating novel molecule that can be synthesized uh, and tested in, in different cell or uh, live animal models. And we're uh, interested in optimizing these, these molecules for multiple properties. Because one of the challenges in, uh, in drug discovery is how can we design the best uh, the best molecule that fits all the design uh, criteria that's needed? Um, and we work with partners, so both uh, biotech, uh, pharmaceutical partners, academic partners, uh, and we support their project from it identification all the way through lead optimization. Um, we're a team of uh, pretty diverse, uh, with pretty diverse set of skills, so spanning computational biology, biophysics, bioinformatics, chemoinformatics, and machine learning. Um, the kind of skills that's needed to bridge the gap between um, drug discovery and machine learning. And we're uh, located at the MIDA and are fortunate to have uh, Yusha Benjou as uh, one of our scientific advisor um, and, and sort of sharing a physical space with a lot of interesting companies. Um, so first I wanted to introduce uh, kind of, I distilled the, what we do in two key problems uh, and wanted to uh, introduce them to you. So first is, uh, how can we model molecular properties using pre-existing data? Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a rather simple question. <laughs> it's a not so simple problem. Uh, and I think it's important to think about this because it's, it doesn't always make sense to try to predict uh, every possible properties of molecule. And let me explain why. Uh, because sometimes we fully understand a system and if a system is simple enough so that we can write mathematical equation about it, uh, then sometimes it's just best to, to stick with, with the simpler approach. A good example of this is, is if we want to compute the molecular weight of a molecule. It's something that is very simply uh, described and we don't need machine learning to solve these problems. Um, there are other more complicated problems that uh, for which we might have a good understanding of the system, but the system might be very complex. So a good example of this is when we want to do molecular ducking or molecular dynamics. So these are extremely complicated system, but we have a good understanding of how they work, uh, but still they're challenging. But where machine learning is most uh, interesting, uh, and I would argue that these, these types of problems are, are the ones that are most frequently um, encountered in drug discovery is when we have a partial understanding of a system and presumably it's a complex system. Uh, so in these this cases, when we have empirical data about uh, the system or process we want to model, it's a good it's a good use case for machine learning. And uh, so in our in our cases and and they do they work. What we do is we we take different molecule structures and we have different properties about them. And what we want to do is uh, is learn a computational model that will you know essentially inform us on on the similar properties of a new molecule. The, uh, the second problem that is of interest for us is uh, given a set of known molecule, which one should I make next? Um, and, and sort of this here simplify, uh, it's a simplified example of the conundrum we're faced with. Um, so if we're lucky, we have uh, already have found a molecule that is active in our, uh, for our disease, uh, but presumably it's not good enough. Uh, so maybe it has good activity and good solubility, but it's failing uh, at these other properties. And often, some of these properties are very expensive, uh, both time-wise and cost-wise, to uh, to uh, to get. So sometimes we just don't have them because of cost considerations. Um, so so what we want to know is the question we're asking is okay, how can I can I start can I get from this starting molecule and a bunch of other molecules that are uh, similar but not not as uh, not ideal to this potentially final molecule that satisfy all of the properties we um, we want to. Um, we want to have. So of course, this is a this is a cartoon, and we don't really we don't expect to have uh, the final answer uh, straight away, right? It's going to require multiple iterations. Um, so it's a it's a simple question, but it's a complex problem. Uh, if the the next molecule we do fails, do we 
Do I learn something out of this experiment? Um, do I know enough about how my molecule work to try to shoot for the best, uh, the best molecule, or should I should it be more productive just improving my understanding of the molecule? Can the next molecule be made easily? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, is there or what is the right trade-off between the cost of synthesis or purchase of a compound and its probability of working? Um, so these are just a couple examples to illustrate that it's a simple question, but it's a it's a problem with a lot of depth. So in practice, what does this look like? Um, so this, uh, I'm going to do my best to illustrate the kind of pipeline or process we uh, that a lot of our project falls into. Uh, so we will, uh, what we do is we work with partners, pharmaceutical partners, biotech partners, academic partners, and these uh, pretty much all have in common that they have developed uh, an in vitro or in vivo assay that can measure how good a molecule is at uh, solving a specific biological problem. And for a number of these molecules, they'll have measured uh, a number of their properties. So how potent the molecule is at, uh, for example, uh, making the cells healthier or the animal healthier? Um, is the molecule selective? So is this targeting specifically a given protein or it's just um, uh, touching a lot of protein in the, uh, in the cell? Uh, does the molecule have good toxicity properties? So these are all examples of property they, they might have um, measured. Uh, what we do is we take these and we, for each of these property, we learn predictive model. So the predictive model takes in, as input a new molecule and uh, predict uh, estimates of these endpoints. And then essentially there is two different paths we can take. The, the path above is, uh, is often preferred when we, have, uh, we don't have medicinal chemistry uh, capabilities. So what we can do is we can go into commercial vendors uh, and these have large libraries of, um, of compound we can purchase. Uh, and these are fairly inexpensive. Uh, and we can purchase a number of them and test them in the in the assay. Uh, for partners that have uh, medicinal chemistry uh, capability, we can suggest new molecules that are that potentially have never been made before, but we will we can make them. Uh, in either case, what we do is uh, we will take the molecules and we'll test them in the the same assays that we started with, and we'll iterate that process until we reach uh, a molecule that satisfies the properties we uh, uh, we set for. Um, so next, I'm going to give you a bit of a technology overview of uh, the thing uh, we are working on to solve these different problems. So first, uh, so as I said, the company is centered around three uh, research team. Uh, so the first one is molecular theorization. Uh, so we're working on new ways uh, of representing the molecule computationally uh, so that these allow us to extract the most relevant features um, to predict their, their properties from uh, 2Ds and 3D uh, representations. The, um, the second aspect of our research uh, is centered around uh, molecular property predictions and particularly from small and sparse data set. Uh, so in, in, in drug discovery, the amount of data we're able to access is often a lot smaller than some uh, other domains uh, where deep learning, for example, have been applied quite successfully. Uh, so we're interested in learning and being able to learn predictive models that are accurate, but when the data sets are very small. And the uh, third axis uh, of interest for us is, is we're working on being able to design molecules that are optimized for multi multiple properties. So that's the real challenge in drug discovery is we have a lot of properties to optimize the molecule against. And some of these comp uh, properties are highly conflicting. So it's, it's really hard to find the best trade-off. Um, so we're trying to do that at the same time, and we also want the molecule we suggest computationally to be easily synthesizable. And that's a big challenge with these computational approaches. Uh, a lot of the first iteration were suggesting molecule that could straight away just not be made or were highly reactive. So any expert would have looked at them and be, oh, that's just, that's, that's nonsense. Um, so these are a couple areas of interest for us. And we're doing that in collaboration with a number of groups uh, Google, Microsoft, Mila, Cambridge, uh, at McGill, uh, and abroad. So very quickly on the, each of these team, uh, 
so here, uh, one way of representing molecule computationally is in the form of a graph. Uh, in the graphical form, uh, the bonds uh, of the molecules are represented by edges and the atoms are represented by nodes. And one of the area of focus uh, at Vivo AI is taking these graph representations and making them interpretable. Um, for a similar reason, as Tessa explained, it's really important for us to be able to explain why a given prediction is actually happening. Uh, so we want to remove the black box element that is uh, often associated with these deep learning approach. Uh, and it's, it's important in real life because we want to understand why so that we can fix the issue with the molecule. We're also doing uh, a, lot of, a lot of research around uh, graph neural networks, better understanding what are their limitations. And, and this specific uh, piece of work here uh, was about how does two uh, separate um, substructure in the molecule can interact with and how can we better extract the information uh, from substructure interacting with the molecule. And we've shown that um, we were able to uh, improve graph neural network uh, to be able uh, to be able to capture this this types of information for uh, for property prediction we use a technique called uh, meta learning and this allows us to learn uh, accurate predictive model when the data is as small as sparse so the basic idea is that uh, you can leverage knowledge learn across across a large collection of tasks uh, so that you increase your your learning efficiency when it comes to a new task um, so a very a good example is standard deep learning networks uh, is very data hungry. Um, so you need a, lot, a large number of uh, active and inactive molecule to be able to accurately predict the activity of a molecule. The, so in meta learning, the, what we do is we first precondition the network on a very diverse set of tasks uh, in a way that allows us to learn uh, the underlying rules of chemistry so that we don't have to relearn these rules uh, for a new project or a new target. Um, and then when we're faced with a new task, we can leverage all this prior information uh, we've been able to embed in our network to model uh, and more accurately predict the, the properties. So a good analogy between meta learning and, and deep learning is, uh, so deep learning uh, can be seen as a kind of junior fresh out of school uh, medicinal chemist with little prior information uh, expertise. And, and meta learning can be seen as a more senior uh, chemist who doesn't need as much uh, information to, uh, to get started in, um, uh, on a specific program. So the third, uh, the third area of focus uh, uh, for us is uh, once we've built a, a predictive model using these uh, appropriate molecular uh, representation and we've been able to learn uh, a model that's despite the, the small amount of data, uh, the next thing we ask ourselves is what, what is the ideal molecule we should, we should make? Um, and for this, we have a lot of uh, different strategy to, uh, to design molecules. Um, and I'm not gonna cover all of them which I'll, uh, today. I'm actually just gonna cover once, one because of the, the, the time constraint. But the takeaway message is that each of these different strategies, they all have pros and cons, and there is none, none of them will always uh, work best across all the project. Um, so it's really good and important for us, uh, and in general, I think, in multiple field of application to have uh, a lot of tools in your toolbox and then be able to deploy all of them and, and see what works best uh, for a given task at hand. So one, one I wanted to touch on today, uh, and, and this it's a sparly, partially because this, this just got published in, the, in ACS uh, five days ago, uh, is this one. So this uh, one, one we've uh, been working for a while is using reinforcement learning over an action space that is uh, represented by building blocks and chemical reactions. So the, um, uh, the basic idea is pretty simple. You have a, a library of building blocks that you have either in-house or that you can purchase, and you also have a set of chemical reactions that you can use to combine these building blocks. And, and the idea is that this defines your action space and you're trying to learn the policy that will get you to molecule that have the most favorable properties. Um, and once you have identified the molecule that has interesting properties, all you need to do is, is backtrack this, this, these different steps. And this uh, gives you a tentative route on how to make uh, this final compound. So it's really good because it gives you the guarantee that you can actually make the compound because it's if you've found a molecule uh, that is impossible to make, you're never gonna be able to test it. 
Uh, so this uh, is a good way to make sure that it's not going to happen. And also, it's a good way to make sure that um, the final molecule has, uh, has properties and is, uh, has good drug-like properties. So I wanted to finish with a, a quick real-world example of how this, uh, how this unfolds. Um, and I've choose uh, this uh, specific project because uh, first it's, it's, it's one of the few that uh, we can actually talk publicly about. Um, so this project was a done in, in collaboration with some people at McGill and at, at Mari. Uh, it was on finding molecules for Parkinson's disease. Um, so the, the project started with a, a set of a, about a thousand molecules uh, that were uh, assayed across uh, four different endpoints. Uh, so two endpoints were related to their activity uh, in neuronal cells, and two endpoints were related to toxicity. And the goal was to identify a new molecule that showed both high activity and low toxicity, um, while also retaining some good uh, um, blood-brain barrier penetration pro uh, um, properties and also good drug-like uh, properties. And one of the challenge of the, this program is that in the initial data that they had generated, a lot of the active compound also showed uh, toxic properties. So they weren't uh, essentially any molecule that had, you know, the ideal um, product profile. So this uh, is a uh, sort of a short schematic of, of how this, uh, this project and a lot of our project that falls into uh, that are similar uh, are, are, are kind of framed. So in, in this case, we had uh, specific data that was generated by, by our partner. We also had internal data set and we've used our te technology to derive a number of different predictive models. So we had two different predictive models for um, the activity endpoints, two, uh, two models for the toxicity endpoint, and we also have some diversity uh, criteria uh, to make sure that the molecule we suggested were diverse. Uh, in this specific case, we choose to go for a um, molecule that were commercially available uh, because this, um, this was a much more you know, cost effective and also faster approach to test the molecule. So we purchased 160 molecules that were then evaluated in the, um, the same neuronal cell assays. So, um, so first thing we, we do uh, when we start a, a project like this is uh, we start we start by learning predictive models, uh, and a good reference we use uh, is the molecule that have already been tested. They also have some of them have been tested in, in what we call duplicates or replicates, and it's important to look at these because uh, it gives you an appreciation that these biological assays are not perfect and they are noisy. So so this uh, this panel here shows uh, each point is a molecule and it's the measurement in the um, the activity assay uh, of a molecule tested twice. And we can see that there is a decent amount of noise, uh, but it's, it's actually pretty good for these types of models. So it's very normal to have this, this types of noise uh, in, in these, uh, these biological assays. And if we compute the, uh, the Pearson correlation coefficient here, we can see that we have a, a 0.73 um, correlation coefficient, which is uh, in this domain, it's, it's good. And what we do is we, we learn a predictive model using that uh, noisy data and we compare how accurate is uh, the prediction of our model, but we, all, we can compare it to the replicability of the, uh, the assay. And in this case, we can see that we're able to capture 90% of the underlying signal, uh, which was uh, really great. So, so next we've used these different predictive models and we've identified a, a number of compounds which we, uh, we then tested. And here we're showing uh, all the blue points are the molecule we, that were proposed uh, using the AI approach. And, and this axis is the activity. So the greater, the better. So the, most, the more active a, a compound is, the better. And this here is, uh, is toxicity. Uh, and the upper part here are the non-toxic compounds. So first we can see that, um, so this part in red here are the active and non-toxic compounds. So these are the one we, uh, we like the most. Um, and so 25% of the molecule actually uh, satisfied both, uh, both criteria of being active and non-toxic. Um, non and although this, if, if you're not uh, from this domain, this might seem like a low number, uh, but it's actually very high because when we run these, uh, these types of, of screen uh, using randomly selected compound, 
we often get a hit rate of lower than 1%. So it's, it's a lot more than what you would get from a classical drug discovery approach. Uh, and also, and we can see that only three molecule uh, satisfy, uh, did not satisfy any of the criteria. So uh, again, uh, pretty impressive to see that we can enrich for uh, such uh, these four criteria altogether. And the, the last thing we, we, uh, we looked at, uh, and that's, that is very important, is um, if, we, if we already know molecules that are active, it's, it's really easy to find new active molecule if we just pick a molecule that is almost the same as the one we already know uh, about. Uh, so the real challenge in drug discovery is how much can you find novel molecules, molecules that are outside of the domain knowledge you already have. Uh, and this is what we were trying to illustrate here. Um, so this axis is the distance to the training data. So all the points are molecule. And the greater the distance a molecule is to the training data, the more novel it is. And this uh, vertical axis is the activity of the molecule. And what we're showing here is the, the orange point are the, the active molecule we were able to, to discover. And we can see that these, uh, these molecules are both active and also novel because they're quite distant, uh, distant uh, from known active molecule. So this is great because this can offer novel and new approach, uh, new starting molecule for, for lead optimization. So I think that's all the time I, I had for you today. Uh, and, and thanks for attending. And if I, I, I saw the, the, the list of participants and I noticed that there's very broad set of people. So if you are interested in, in joining, interning, partnering, uh, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to, uh, to maybe dig deeper in uh, specific, these specific directions. Super. Thanks, Sebastian, for this fascinating presentation. So now we will move to the question period. So I invite the, uh, the, the participants to write in the chat section a question they, they have for one of the, uh, um, uh, the uh, presenters, Sebastian or Tess. I know we had a couple of questions for Tess at the beginning. Uh, so I have questions for you guys. We can start with Sebastian. So I know you're a co-founder of in vivo, uh, in vivo AI, and I was curious, like what, what has helped you get to where you are now in your career and what advice would you have to others who wants to set off in a similar direction, Sebastian? It's a good question. <laughs> um, well, first, this, this, this area of machine learning for drug discovery is, uh, is an area I've been involved in for a very long time. Um, so I'm, I'm originally a computer scientist, but have really been doing my, my, my thesis and postdoc in this domain. So I've spent quite a bit of time there. Also spent some time at Imagia, which was a really uh, good experience as well. Um, so for me, I would say the main, the main criteria that allowed me to, to be there today is kind of this relentless, you know, just shoot for one goal like if you're really specialized in something then it really makes sense to to start a company around that thing um and and i think you can be successful that way super uh thanks and uh, now we have uh, three questions uh the first one is from william so I will, I will, I think you can see it, but I will just repeat it for the attendees. So taking into account how mass molecules in health target binding sites on proteins, allosteric, osteoteric, et cetera, how influential do you think alpha fold this breakthrough will impact your own work? Um, I think the alpha fold uh, kind of breakthrough was, um, Okay, <laughs> let me start by not directly answering the question. <laughs> uh, so let's let's start by resuming what AlphaFold did. So essentially, they they um, showed that you could you could from the sequence of a protein predict their conformation in 3D, uh, which was a kind of open problem for a long time. Uh, people have been trying to do that, but they were not able to do it with enough accuracy to be usable and uh, um, to reach kind of the the threshold of usability that was set before. Um, so what they've shown is that you can actually predict uh, uh, protein conformation from uh, just the, the amino acid structure of a protein. Um, I think the, this work is really good, but on the other hand, like we already know how to obtain the, the real uh, structure of a protein using crystallography, right? So it's not, it's like it's providing us information that was unobtainable before. 
uh, and also this 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 whole field of uh, you know structure based drug design uh, has its own limitation, which was already there when we obtained the structures from crystallographic. Uh, uh, approach. So I think it's a, it's a real breakthrough in kind of predicting this information, but I don't think it's going to be that big of a game changer just by itself uh, in drug discovery. Although uh, I'm sure this is going to have multiple, uh, you know, repercussion uh, and there are things that we're going to be able to do because of that that we were not able to do. But I would say today, uh, it's not like we've solved drug discovery. Okay. Uh, another one from William. Also, do you take... Do you take into account the metabolic steaming from the molecules and their own potential effect on the system post transformation degradation before excretion? Uh, yes, we do. When we have the data to uh, to uh, the information about this, uh, so for example, we uh, we do model a number of uh, of endpoints that measure toxicity, like SIP inhibition, P450. Uh, and metabolite is, is one of them. Uh, I would say that's generally one of the endpoints where it's really hard to get the data about. Uh, so I would say it's, a, it's one of the challenging ones. Um, but it, yes, it's possible to take it into account um, if, if you have the data for it. And the last question from Guy, how basically do you collect your data? We, uh, we don't collect it per se because most often we, I mean, all the time we, we do these projects in partnership with people that have generated the data. So these are either academic lab, uh, biotech and pharma that have generated the data. Uh, and of course the data is, is theirs um, and it's highly proprietary. So we don't, um, uh, we don't collect the data uh, as in uh, a lot of uh, AI company would do because it's, it's simply not uh, something that anyone would agree to. One question for a test. Uh, where do you see this uh, AI technology you're using at Imagine the upcoming, like in, in five years? Where do you think it would be? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think what's interesting here is, uh, well, as the year goes by, we get more and more data. And like, as you might know, getting clinical data or hospital data takes a lot of time, just annotating it, it's super long. So for now, the models that we have are mostly trained on natural images of very scarce data that we can get uh, because everything is not treated yet or annotated. So what I see is getting like more and more specific models and uh, better accuracies, but also being able to pinpoint uh, new problematics around this. And uh, as I said, going is uh, like technologies in deep learning are getting better and better. So for example, what you saw in 3D uh, was in a very tiny patch, but uh, I can see it growing on bigger images and having models that appreciates more the type of data that we have. So yeah, it'd be like better solutions to, to these very specific uh, medical uh, problems, I guess. Super. Thanks, Tess. So I think it's time to conclude the webinar. I'd like to thank our guest speakers, Tess and Sebastian, for their time. So thanks, guys, for coming today. Uh, also, a recording of this webinar will be available on our, uh, on our YouTube channel uh, if, you, if you want to revisit it. If you would like to hear more about uh, Corbett, this is a new free limited program to train your teams or calling in data science. Uh, you can contact us at corbett.ai. Also for the participants here, uh, there's going to be a link to our survey in the chat section where you can share your idea and thoughts on this webinar. And the survey, the survey will be available below this video on our YouTube channel. So stay tuned for next webinar on AI progress. And I wish you a happy holiday, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for inviting us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>